On the clear morning of October 21st, 1994, around 7 o'clock, a blue van slowly made its way to the Gangnam district of Seoul. The vehicle carried 11 passengers, all members of the Seoul Metropolitan Police Department's 3rd Mobile Brigade, serving as volunteer police officers. It was Korean Police Day, and to celebrate this significant occasion, they planned to go to the Gangnam Police Department to receive commendations as exemplary police officers. It was a day of celebration and recognition, and each person on the van was filled with joyful emotions. Lee Kyung Jai, a 21-year-old volunteer police officer, and his colleagues sang along to the songs playing on the radio, feeling that life was about to unfold a new chapter. At 7.35 in the morning, the van drove onto the surface of the Seongsu Bridge. The drizzle created a gentle patter, casting a somewhat somber atmosphere over the entire bridge. Lee noticed a fully loaded bus and several cars traveling alongside them. With a little more distance to cover, it seemed like they would smoothly cross the bridge. At that moment, Lee suddenly observed small stones, seemingly coming from nowhere, intermittently striking the car windows. Puzzled by this, he then felt the vehicle rapidly tilting backward. Hit the brakes, someone next to Lee shouted loudly. Following that, a thunderous roar echoed, and he subsequently lost all consciousness. After a few minutes, Lee gradually regained consciousness. He looked around and noticed that the others in the van were also waking up. However, when he looked up, he was shocked to see a massive fractured bridge towering dozens of meters above in the sky. The bridge was crowded with onlookers, all staring in their direction. A strong sense of disorientation overwhelmed him, and his heart felt like it might leap out of his chest. What had happened? Where were they? At 7.39 in the morning, the Seoul Metropolitan Police received a distress call. The caller reported that the Seongsu Bridge over the Han River had suddenly collapsed. Initially, the dispatcher might have thought they misheard, but soon the police department, fire brigade, and medical units all swiftly mobilized and rushed to the Seongsu Bridge. The incident had indeed occurred. In today's episode, let's delve into a real and significant disaster that occurred in South Korea, the collapse of the Seongsu Bridge. The Han River flows from east to west, traversing the entire city of Seoul and dividing it into the bustling districts of Gangbuk, north of the river, and Gangnam, south of the river. To connect these two regions, several large bridges were constructed across the river, and one of them was the Seongsu Bridge. This bridge linked the neighborhoods of Apgujong and Seongsu, both crucial areas in Seoul. The bridge's accessibility had become a part of the daily routine for the local residents. However, how could such a significant bridge suddenly break apart? While en route to the bridge, encountering some traffic delays, the police officers in their vehicles could already see from a distance that a substantial section of the Seongsu Bridge was missing in the middle. Around 7.50 in the morning, several police cars were among the first to arrive at the scene. The officers were completely stunned as they reached the broken bridge. They witnessed a fracture spanning over 30 meters on the bridge deck. Looking down from above, they saw a section of the bridge, vertically suspended over the distant river, with vehicles scattered on the broken surface. This meant that the entire segment of the bridge had dropped vertically into the water below. After several minutes, the rescue teams finally snapped out of their shock. They hastily grabbed their radios, requesting boat support as the situation urgently demanded waterborne assistance. Before the police arrived, the volunteer police officer, Lee Kyung Jai, who had almost fallen into the river, gradually recovered from the chaos. The van he was in was positioned in the center of the broken bridge, and perhaps due to its relatively stable descent, the vehicle did not suffer severe damage, and the occupants were mostly unharmed. As Lee and his colleagues stepped onto the bridge, they heard cries for help all around and saw people in the river desperately waving for assistance. Apart from the van, many vehicles were stranded on the broken bridge, he saw a black sedan parked next to the van, and another car stuck at the edge of the broken bridge in the distance. Although these two cars were damaged, the occupants had crawled out and seemed to have suffered only minor injuries. However, 
When he shifted his attention to the overturned bus in the center of the bridge, an eerie feeling immediately ran down his spine. Unlike the other vehicles, this bus was upside down. Lee cautiously approached the position of the bus, and as he got closer, he was astonished to find that the height of the entire bus only reached his waist. Carefully looking down, he discovered a densely packed mass of people inside the bus. This bus had been flattened under the force of the fall. Given the urgency of the situation, Lee quickly called for others and began pulling each person out of the bus. The police officers had to take off their own clothes to keep the injured warm, but they had no idea how many more people were still trapped inside the bus. Around 8.10 a.m., the first batch of rescue boats and several helicopters arrived at the scene, approximately 30 minutes after the collapse. The rescue team discovered a total of four vehicles on the bridge, but when they saw the flattened bus, they immediately gasped in shock. The damage to this bus was extremely severe. Due to the efforts of the police officers in the initial rescue, approximately a dozen people had already been pulled out. They found two passengers with relatively minor injuries near the rear door of the bus. It seemed that the rear door's railing had absorbed much of the impact, creating a space for the two individuals beneath it to survive. The rest of the passengers inside the bus were tragically lost their lives. The passengers on the bus were mainly students from the local Muhak Women's High School and working professionals commuting to their workplaces. Due to the bodies being entangled with the wreckage, it took nearly a day to remove all the deceased. Many family members fainted on the spot upon seeing the bodies, while others couldn't stand upright and collapsed on the ground, turning the scene into a hellish nightmare. Additionally, as it was uncertain how many vehicles and individuals might have fallen into the water, alongside rescuing survivors on the bridge, the rescue team also initiated underwater searches. Soon the rescue team salvaged a car from the river, containing a driver and a passenger, both of whom had drowned as they were unable to escape the vehicle. A little later, they retrieved a second car from the river, with its driver also found deceased. The subsequent search continued for three days and nights, but no other victims were discovered. In total, the Xiongsu Bridge incident resulted in the tragic death of 32 people with over 10 others sustaining injuries. On the severely damaged bus out of 31 passengers, 29 tragically lost their lives, making it the deadliest bridge disaster in post-war South Korea. The Seong Su Bridge has a width of 19.4 meters and a span of 1160 meters, was constructed in 1977, completed in 1979 by the prominent South Korean conglomerate Dong Ah Construction, costing 11.6 billion Korean won and by the time of the accident in 1994, it was only 15 years old. How could a bridge with such a short lifespan collapse so horrifically? Initially, the investigative team suspected terrorism, perhaps a bomb. However, the results they released soon after shook the entire South Korea. In the 1970s, South Korea was experiencing rapid economic growth, and Seoul had two main requirements for newly constructed bridges. They had to be grand and alleviate the traffic pressure on surrounding bridges. The Seongsu Bridge employed the latest cantilever truss technology of that time. This structural design utilized steel materials arranged in triangles, constructed on bridge piers to distribute the load. Unlike traditional bridges that required numerous piers to bear the load, the truss structure significantly reduced the number of piers needed. While the Yanghua Bridge on the Han River had pier intervals of 35 meters, the Seongsu Bridge achieved an impressive 120-meter interval, giving it a majestic appearance. Upon the completion of the bridge, the construction company even claimed that the Seongsu Bridge was a fusion of technology and aesthetics, symbolizing an era. However, a series of issues were discovered during the post-incident inspection of the bridge. Firstly, while the truss structure indeed has many advantages, its precision and sophistication demand the use of higher quality materials and more meticulous welding techniques. In the design of the Seongsu Bridge, the thickness of the structural beam was specified as 18 millimeters, and the design drawings called for the use of an X-shaped beveling welding process, allowing the weld to pass through the entire steel beam. However, during actual construction, the weld seam only reached an exaggerated 2 millimeters, leaving the center of the material essentially hollow, severely compromising the structural strength. Moreover, it wasn't just the welding points. They discovered issues with the bolts as well. The construction team inserted bolts unprofessionally, 
some bolts and holes didn't match in size, and they simply found larger openings to force the bolts into. To make matters worse, some bolts were outright missing. Furthermore, during the initial design phase, the daily traffic volume planned for the Seongsu Bridge was 50,000 vehicles, but at the time of the accident, it had already exceeded 100,000 vehicles. To address the issue of traffic congestion, the government had even increased the number of lanes on the bridge. Through multiple simulations with the same load and welding processes, the investigation team found that the bridge should have collapsed eight years ago. The fact that the Seongsu Bridge managed to stand for 15 years was a miracle in itself. The most alarming revelation for the investigation team was the clear signs of the bridge collapse. And not just once, there were multiple signals that occurred many times. If any one of these instances had been taken seriously, the disaster could have been completely avoided. Several weeks before the accident, the management noticed that the bridge deck often shook inexplicably. A few days before the incident, cracks were spotted on the bridge. The day before the collapse, someone observed that the connection point at the accident site was much wider than other locations. Reports were filed for each of these incidents, but the authorities did not take any further repair measures. On the morning of October 21st at 6 a.m., an hour and a half before the incident, a truck driver crossing the bridge heard a loud bang and felt the entire bridge shaking. Terrified, he quickly reported it, and still, the relevant department claimed they would inspect it once the rain stopped. Finally, at 7.38 a.m., a van carrying police officers, a bus full of passengers, and four cars simultaneously passed between the 10th and 11th pillars of the Seongsu Bridge. At that moment, the overloaded truss had reached its limit, and one of the vertical rods in the cantilever beam of the 10th pillar's truss weld seam broke, triggering a domino effect. The bridge deck collapsed instantly, resembling falling building blocks, plunging 20 meters into the Han River below. Two cars directly plunged into the water, while the other two cars and the police van followed the collapsing bridge, avoiding severe damage. As for the last bus, it had just crossed the collapsing bridge when the collapse occurred. However, the rear half of the bus was left hanging. Since the bus had a rear engine, the weight at the back caused the entire bus to flip 180 degrees backward, finally landing on the collapsed bridge 20 meters below with its roof. The vehicle's interior space was compressed by more than half, and these people were instantly stacked on top of each other. 12 hours after the tragedy, Seoul Mayor Lee Won-jung was forced to step down, and the president of the construction company, Choi Won-suk, arrived at the scene. After witnessing the severity of the accident, Choi remained silent for a long time and expressed that the company would take full responsibility. However, a few days later, Choi's attitude underwent a dramatic change. He explained to the media that, upon returning to the company and conducting a thorough investigation, he found that from a legal perspective, the company was not liable. According to the legal provisions at the time, the construction party's legal liability period was five years. And since the completion of the Seongsu Bridge had been 15 years, the responsibility for the accident should be borne by the project management unit, namely the Seoul City Government. Thus, the responsibility was shifted to the Seoul City Government. Under public pressure, the Seoul City Government provided an explanation. They stated that the project had indeed been transferred to the government, and the city government was responsible for maintenance and inspection. However, the regulations at the time focused mainly on the inspection of facilities over 20 years old, and since the Seongsu Bridge had only been built for 15 years, it was not yet within the scope of inspection from the beginning. In December 1994, the Seoul District Court filed a lawsuit against 17 individuals related to the construction company and the Seoul City Government. According to the laws at that time, those responsible for construction accidents could generally be punished by revoking their licenses. Therefore, in the first trial, the court found all 17 individuals guilty but imposed a suspended sentence, releasing them all on the spot. Faced with such absurd results, the public took to the streets in protest. The prosecution eventually overturned the first trial's decision and charged three individuals from Dong Ah Construction and the government with involuntary manslaughter, sentencing them to between one and a half to two years in prison. This was the conclusion of the Xiongsu Bridge incident.
Under the dominance of capital pursuing quantity and efficiency, regulatory standards might struggle to keep pace with the rapid economic development. In order to boost construction speed and reduce costs, many construction projects in South Korea, during the era of high-speed development, often went to companies that offered the lowest bids and promised swift completion. For instance, the bidding price from Dong Ah Construction for the Seongsu Bridge project was only half of the expected cost, a situation that could easily lead to the emergence of low-quality projects. Nine months after the Seongsu Bridge incident, the Sampung department store collapsed, and the consecutive occurrence of these two disasters had a profound impact on Korean society. Following these events, the South Korean government began to reflect on construction safety issues and initiated a systematic reform of building regulations. At the end of 1994, the Seoul city government conducted a comprehensive assessment of bridge safety, followed by extensive inspections of numerous non-compliant structures in 1995. Many buildings were demolished and reconstructed, and building regulations gradually improved as a result. In 2001, due to a series of issues stemming from the Seongsu Bridge, Dong Ah Construction declared bankruptcy. In 1997, the Seongsu Bridge was reconstructed on the same site. During the reopening ceremony, the new construction contractor, Hyundai Construction, invited some of the families of the victims to participate, allowing them to offer flowers in memory of their lost loved ones. In reality, many family members had not dared to cross the bridge in the four years since the tragedy. Some questioned repeatedly why they couldn't have somehow stopped their loved ones in time. Just a few seconds delay could have averted their misfortune. Such tragedies often leave family members with immense regret, and the sense of remorse may linger for a lifetime. The assurance of safety should not be a reminder paid with human lives. One can only hope that such incidents will not be repeated.